Last month, a crop duster took off from a small private strip in Arkansas. Routine flight, familiar terrain. But within seconds, everything went wrong. The aircraft veered off course, plowed through a soybean field, and flipped upside down in a ditch. The pilot didn't make it. And now, investigators are digging into the wreckage of Air Tractor, November 9185 Foxtrot, searching for the real reason behind this fatal crash. Today, we're diving into what we know so far, and what's still unclear. So, let's begin with the facts laid out in the NTSB's preliminary report. The aircraft involved was an Air Tractor AT-502, a rugged, single-seat crop duster specifically built for agricultural use. This particular flight was being conducted under Part 137, which is a regulation for aerial application, basically crop dusting. These flights often operate out of remote, privately owned strips, and that was the case here. The pilot was departing from a 2,300-foot paved airstrip just outside of Grady, Arkansas, around 6.30 p.m. on June 6, 2025. Now 2,300 feet may sound like a lot, but for an AGE aircraft possibly loaded with chemical payload and fuel, it's not all that generous. Especially when you're factoring in Arkansas summer heat, temps were around 31 degrees Celsius, which can reduce engine and lift performance. That's a detail we'll come back to later. Here's where things started going sideways, literally. Tire marks showed that about 300 feet from the end of the runway, the aircraft's tailwheel veered off to the right side. A tailwheel, by the way, is the small wheel at the back of the aircraft that helps with ground steering during takeoff and landing. So the fact that only the tailwheel made that first mark off runway suggests that the aircraft may have yawed or twisted around its vertical axis. That kind of early deviation can hint at directional control issues, pilot overcorrection, or even a mechanical fault. Then, things escalated fast. The tracks changed from one to three, meaning all the landing gear touched the ground again, this time on grass. That track continued for about 200 feet, then crossed into a soybean field. There's a particularly telling detail here. The center wheel track, the one made by the tailwheel, was offset relative to the main wheels. That could mean the aircraft was skidding or slewing, perhaps due to a sudden correction, a crosswind, or even an issue with the rudder. Finally, about 450 feet beyond the end of the runway, the airplane struck an irrigation ditch. That's where it flipped over and came to rest inverted, belly up, in a field. The crash caused substantial damage to the airframe, including fragmentation of the left wing and a partial separation of the aft fuselage, or rear portion of the aircraft. Thankfully, there was no fire. But tragically, the pilot didn't survive the impact. What's truly haunting about this sequence is how fast it all happened. From start of roll to impact, we're likely talking about less than 10 seconds. That's how quickly things can unravel in low-level AGE aviation. The pilot of November 9185 Foxtrot was identified as Brian Holland, a Mississippi-based AG pilot. He was the sole occupant of the aircraft, and sadly, he died at the scene. As of now, there's limited public information about his background or flight hours, but we do know he was flying for Farm Brothers Flyers LLC, a company that conducts agricultural spraying operations in the region. Now, if you're not familiar with this kind of work, Ag pilots operate under some of the toughest flying conditions out there. It's low altitude, high frequency, heavy loads, tight schedules, and fatigue often creeps in, especially during peak spraying seasons. These are not your typical cross-country flights at cruising altitude. This is intense, hands-on flying with very little margin for error. It's important we approach this part with respect. The purpose of analyzing early findings is not to place blame, it's to understand what factors might have led up to the crash so others can learn and hopefully avoid a similar fate. And that's why Brian's story matters. Now let's talk about what investigators found in the wreckage. And again, these are early observations. So nothing here is final, but some of it is definitely worth thinking about. The left wing was severely fragmented 
and the rear section of the fuselage, basically the tail, was partially torn from the main structure. Despite that structural chaos, the engine mount, though bent, had held on. The engine itself appeared to be intact, which is actually quite interesting. It suggests that the power plant may have been functioning normally right up until impact. Of course, we can't confirm that until teardown and fuel system analysis are completed, which the NTSB says they'll be doing later. Now here's where it gets a little more technical, but important. Investigators checked the flight control continuity. Basically, they're looking to see if the pilot was able to move the control surfaces, like the ailerons, rudder, and elevators, from the cockpit. In this case, they confirmed that the ailerons and elevators were still connected, even though there was damage to some linkages, like a bent pushrod in the elevator system. The most curious finding? The left rudder cable was found frayed and separated just ahead of the control horn, the part that connects the cable to the moving rudder itself. The NTSB described it as an overstress failure, which typically means the cable snapped due to extreme force rather than wear or corrosion. The right rudder cable, meanwhile, was still intact. Now, here's the critical question. Did that rudder cable fail before the crash, contributing to the loss of control? Or did it fail during the crash sequence as the aircraft flipped? Unfortunately, the report doesn't confirm that yet, and it may take lab analysis to determine. But the rudder is the main component responsible for directional control on takeoff. If that control was compromised at any point, even for a second, it could explain why the aircraft yawed off the center line so early in the roll. Also worth noting, investigators recovered the Satlock GPS unit from the plane. That's a navigation and spray tracking system widely used in crop dusting. It stores a lot of data, flight paths, speeds, even application patterns. Once that's downloaded, it might shed more light on what the plane was doing in those final moments. So, to sum up this part, not in conclusion, but in curiosity, we're seeing a picture of a sudden loss of directional stability, some serious structural destruction from impact, and a potential mechanical factor in the rudder system. But we don't have the full puzzle yet. Now let's zoom out a bit and talk about the operating environment, because sometimes it's not just one dramatic failure that causes an accident, but a chain of subtle stacking conditions. First, the weather. At the time of the flight, conditions were what pilots call VMC, clear skies, visibility around 10 miles, light wind at six knots from 240 degrees. So we can rule out weather as an immediate factor. But here's what's more interesting, temperature and field setup. It was a hot day, 31 degrees Celsius, and hot air is less dense. That affects aircraft performance. Less dense air means less lift generated by the wings, and the engine doesn't produce quite as much power. That's known as a high density altitude situation, and it can increase the runway length required for takeoff. Now combine that with a 2,300 foot runway, not particularly long, and a possibly heavily loaded aircraft, given that ag planes often carry a full load of liquid chemicals. While we don't know the exact load on this flight, these conditions collectively tighten the performance margins. Everything has to go right, or you quickly run out of space and options. Also worth mentioning, the runway had no known instrument aids or lighting. It's a private use strip, likely surrounded by open fields and obstacles like irrigation ditches, which in this case became a deadly terrain trap when the aircraft left the paved surface. What's really crazy is how fast something so small, a slight veer, a split second delay in rudder input, or an overloaded takeoff can compound under these kinds of conditions. And that's the uncomfortable truth in agricultural aviation. Sometimes you're flying at the edge of what's operationally acceptable, and there's just no room for recovery if things slip. So where does that leave us? Right now, the NTSB is still deep in the fact gathering phase. They've retained the GPS tracking unit. They've planned a deeper examination of the fuel system and engine internals, and possibly most critical, They'll be analyzing that separated rudder cable in a lab setting to determine whether it failed before the impact or as a result of it. And here's why this all matters, not just for investigators, but for the entire ag aviation industry. This isn't the first time an air tractor has been involved in a crash during takeoff or low-level operations. Previous incidents involving similar aircraft have sometimes pointed to performance miscalculations, wire strikes, 
or sudden control input failures. But this case, November 9185 Foxtrot, is shaping up to be another example of how even in broad daylight, on a clear day, the job is never routine. We also have to talk about pilot workload. These flights aren't just about flying, they're about timing chemical releases, coordinating with ground crews, dodging obstacles, and doing it all over and over again. The pilot is both aviator and technician, under pressure. And, although the preliminary report doesn't mention fatigue or distraction, those human factors are always on the table during the investigation. But again, no conclusions here. The investigation is still unfolding, and we're working with limited data. We're not here to speculate, and we're certainly not here to criticize someone who lost their life doing a difficult job. What we are here to do is learn. Because every time something goes wrong in aviation, there's a chain of decisions, conditions, and mechanical realities behind it. And understanding that chain, even when it's incomplete, is how we improve.